I want to explain to you just the term drawdown. Drawdown, uh, in the context of climate, refers to that first time when greenhouse gases peak and go down on a year-to-year -year basis. So that is what drawdown is. It comes from a conclusion I made in 2001, which the goals that we are naming with respect to climate change were rather weak need. Uh, mitigation, reduction, slowing, um, all these terms didn't make sense to me given the gravity of the situation and, and what we knew from the science. What made a very big impression on me was this trip I took in 2009 to the North Greenland Emian Ice Research Station, which is in the very north of Greenland. I went there with the uh, Crown Prince of Norway, Crown Prince of Denmark, and the Crown Princess of Sweden. So it was a royal fact-finding journey. We went there to really look at the science. What is going on with respect to the science of climate change? This is what it's like in summer. <laughs> you can only go there in the summer, and I won't um, bore you with this too much. When you go there, you sleep outside in tents at minus 20 degrees, you know, in a sleeping bag. And um, I can tell you when you have to get up in the night and pee, it is just awful. Um, and uh, this looks like a sort of a B-grade scientific, you know, sci-fi movie, which you're seeing here. Um, they drill down uh, 2,500 meters eventually to bedrock to really research um, the Emian period 125,000 years ago. To me, this is what that trip to Greenland and this is what uh, really, really emphasized to me that can we name the goal? And the goal cannot be stabilization, mitigation, reduction, slowing, continuous improvement. It just doesn't make sense. And the only goal that makes sense is to reverse it. Let's go the other way. If you're going down the wrong road, slowing down doesn't change the fact that it's the wrong road. You know, or another way to put it, um, if you're going over a cliff, slowing down just makes Thelma and Louise in slow motion. In other words, it's still going over the cliff. And so I wanted to name the goal. And what Project Drawdown about is about, I should go back before you read this little thing, is really about can we achieve it? I, I, I don't know. No one really has mapped, measured, or modeled the 100 most substantive solutions to global warming. It's never been done. In order to do this, to map, measure, and model the 100 most substantive solutions, we had to figure out how to do it with no money. Um, and nobody wanted to give us the money to do it because we didn't have the expertise, frankly. Uh, I'm a journalist. I'm not a scientist. Uh, so we decided it had to be a coalition. It had to be a credible coalition of people from all over the world who do have PhDs, who, do have, who are scientists, who are respected, who are IPCC lead authors, who do run companies, who do run governments, etc. So we put together a coalition and we put a call out all over the world to scholars at universities uh, to be drawdown fellows and we got just extraordinary CVs. Um, these are White House fellows, Aga Khan Award winners, Rhodes Scholars, etc half PhDs, 40% women, all have advanced degrees, and they became our core researchers. And to them, we added 128 advisors. Some of them are here in the room. So we had an advisory council, and on top of this, we had 40 outside expert scientific reviewers of the models themselves. When we came together and published the book and published the data, that pretty much people would say, you did your homework, and that it was not one person or a small group doing the math. And that's what we did. We did the math. That's all we did. All the carbon data you see here is peer-reviewed science. We didn't take anybody's assertions, beliefs, or anything like that. So this gives you an example. It's in, you'll see it in the book. The book has content, not just photos. We rank it by carbon impact. And there's only two things, of course, you can do about global warming. You can stop putting greenhouse gases up there. Conservation, right, efficiency, substitution of fossil fuels with renewable clean energy, or you can bring it back home, sequestration. There's only two things you can do. This is 16.6 .6 gigatons, metric tons of carbon emissions avoided with this technology by 2050. And I just want to go through solutions one very quickly just to give you a sense of the variety and the diversity of solutions that came up. We went through probably 300 different solutions and then winnowed them out to be the ones that had the greatest impact. High-speed rail, 
This is indigenous people's land management. This is improved rice production. Rice is a major source of methane emissions. Wind is the number two solution. Look at the savings, $7.43 trillion by 2050. It says billion, but that's a typo. It's trillion. This is billion. We model them differently because the costs are so different for these. These solutions are not just substitutions. It's not like, well, this works better. This has a lower carbon footprint or something like that. These actually change people's lives. This is forest protection, the Cromody Bear and the Great Bear Forest in British Columbia. Clean cook stoves, this is about black carbon, which is a very short-lived but very, very powerful pollutant that uh, causes warming. This is number five solution, which is the protection, restoration of tropical forests. This one is household recycling. This is managed grazing. Again, I just want to go through these. This is an electric bike. This is the man who makes them in Berlin. This is biochar, terra preta, which goes back 500 at least years, maybe more. This is telepresence. This is a transport solution. In overall, and you'll see the whole list is in your book, but what surprised us uh, is that food was eight of the top 20 solutions. We did not see that coming at all. The number four solution is a plant-rich diet, which basically reduces animal protein in the northern or richer countries from uh, 100 grams average to about 50 grams, which is a healthy level, unless you're a super athlete. Um, and it raises the protein content in those countries where people are uh, uh, not getting sufficient nourishment and also raises the caloric content. So it, it does both. It's not just one or the other. Uh, and yet it's the number four solution. And the number three solution is reduced food waste. And so you can see the food sector was larger then energy, I should say energy, it's really the electrical generation part of energy. Energy suffuses all of these uh, transport, the built environment. Energy was really five of the top 20. If you combine number 22, offshore wind, they become the number one solution, not refrigerant management. And then this also surprised us. This is educating girls. Their life is chosen for them in many ways. And those uh, girls, still girls, have an average uh, of, of, of five plus children. And this, which is family planning, these two together really measure the difference between the UN high and median population in 2050, between 10.8 and 9.7 billion. This is straight up UN, World Bank, WHO numbers. They're not our numbers. And these are low numbers. These are low numbers. But if you combine them, empowering girls and women becomes the number one solution to addressing global warming. It's like, yeah, and who knew? But the whole thing about this for us is who knew, who knew, who knew? And, and you know, um, we certainly didn't, by the way, and I just want to make that very clear. So many people come to me and say, oh, it's so ambitious. <laughs> I love that. It's like, let's just let civilization go. That seems to be a reasonable course, you know. <laughs> But what you're talking about is so ambitious, you know, and I'm going, oh, okay. I want to just explain the title. It's so brash and cheeky, and I know that, and I apologize, barely. The most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming, the reason we titled that is to make sure you understand that no other plan ever has been proposed to reverse global warming. So we could have said the most nuanced, we could have said the most brilliant, the most colorful plan. No matter what we said, it would be true because there's nothing to compare it to. And why this is true at this point in time, I do not know, but it is so. This is the Rosetta Stone. All this is about reframing. It's not just about measuring and modeling. What it is about rethinking our relationship to carbon, to uh, the atmosphere, and to each other, our relationships with each other. And the language we're using around climate change is guaranteed to do what it's done. Decarbonization, really? Decarbonization is the name of the problem. It is not the name of the solution, with all due respect. So it's a negative term. Then we have negative emissions, another negative term. We're using negative terms to describe what we need to do. And that does not exactly light up people's fire, you know, in imagination. Then, on top of that, at least on the NGO level, and we see it everywhere, we're going to tackle climate change, we're going to fight climate change, we're going to combat climate change. We're using war metaphors, war verbs, to actually talk about a relationship to this extraordinary system called the atmosphere. 
which is our ally and protects us. And the only true boundary on Earth is the atmosphere. It's the only true boundary. Individual feels guilty. They may feel shame. They may feel, oh, you know, I have a mortgage, I have kids, my mother is not doing well, you know, I have to take care of her. I mean, they're stressed. And then we put this on them and say, you know, welcome to the world of global warming, good luck. And it produces what? Empathy? No. Apathy. Care? No. Indifference. Enlivening? No. Numbness. You know, it does. It produces the opposite result. And so unless we language this as a opportunity, as a gift really, because every system that ignores feedback dies. This is feedback from a system called the atmosphere. The relationship between physics and biochemistry. Okay, we know the principles. We've known them for a long time. So feedback is our ally. So we have to then reimagine this relationship in such a way that we see it as happening for us, not to us. As long as we think this is happening to us, then we have eschewed responsibility. And two, what happens when you say it's to us? Well, you're a victim, you're the object, something happened to you, somebody else is responsible. The United States was suing oil companies because they knew about it. In the meeting we had, uh, I thought it was Chatham House, I know it was Chatham House Rules, but wherever it was on the Thames River, in this little inn, I mean, I can say, without really compromising it too much, I mean, Shell knew about global warming then, so did Phillips, so did Conoco, so did Exxon, they all knew about it, they knew it very well. This is not a surprise, they're not stupid, these companies. And so, as long as we sort of demonize it, you know, then what is our life like? If we see it as happening for us, that is to say, you take 100% responsibility, it's happening for us. Now, what am I gonna do? I'm gonna reimagine the world. I'm gonna innovate, I'm going to create, I'm going to think about what it is that we can do at this point in time. And so, we have a choice as human beings, as institutions, to go one way or the other. And one way, to me, is interesting and is a good life, and one of them, actually, is a dead end, it's the cul-de-sac. And so that is really what Drawdown is about. And by mapping and measuring and modeling these solutions and presenting them in such a way that they actually engage people, they go, oh, how interesting, I didn't know. Look at that picture. We give anecdotes, we give narratives, we give stories. The first solar panel was in 1884 in New York City on a rooftop. Two years before, the first coal-fired power plant was built in the United States as well, in the same city, in New York City. And at that time, they had op opposing editorials as to which would prevail, solar or coal. Of course, solar won. <laughs> it just took a while. When we understand that this is the human story, and that anything humans do, they can undo. They can undo. We can undo this. We can reverse this. And, but we can't do it unless we orient ourselves in such a way that is towards the solutions, towards um, drawing down. And I just want to start with one of our famous American scientists, uh, Matt Damon. Uh, and if you didn't see The Martian, spoiler alert, he comes back. I saw him actually a few weeks ago. He didn't see me, but I saw him, that's all. Um, but there's a wonderful scene at the end where he's talking to, you know, wannabe astronauts and he's come back and he's got gray hair and, you know, he's like the wise, the wise one. And he says, and uh, I don't have the, I, I, I'll never be an actor because I couldn't memorize the script, but he said basically, when you go up there, you absolutely, you think you're going to die. It's going to happen to you, no question about it. And when that happens, you have to make up your mind. What are you going to do? Are you going to give up? Or are you going to solve the problem? And he said, to solve the problem, and love this part, he said, you do the math. <laughs> like, ah. You do the math. And you solve one problem, and you solve the next, and then you solve the next one. And if you solve enough problems, you get to come home. And to me, climate change, reversing global warming, is about coming home. That's what it's about. Thank you so much.